five on Google Hangouts. Um, so if your notes aren't good, you can go back and watch it again. I'm going to the Calvert Library's YouTube page. Um, if you don't want your name, you know, don't tell your name on, on live you know, if, you, if you have some privacy issues, but it won't, it won't be recording you because um, you're all behind the camera unless you go up front. So just so you know that it is being recorded. Um, and like I say, we love this partnership, and I'm going to turn it over now to Master Gardener, Bridget Shop, or Bridget Chart, Chart. Chart, and who's um, a Master Gardener, a past biology teacher, and um, also a gardener at ACLT. Okay. Oh, awesome. um, I put my email up there. If anybody wants to copy that down, I do have a lot of resources and things that you can. Um, I'm happy to send the PowerPoint to you. Just email me. Just give it up there for a second. So um, we are part of the University of Maryland through the Agricultural Department um, and the Maryland Extension is who trains the master gardeners and all of these programs come through that. Okay, so when Barry said what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. I am in the last couple of years I've become completely obsessed with soil. <laughs> Um, it's quite amazing, and hopefully I can give you a little idea of why. So a lot of us think of soil as kind of being this, you know, nothing. <laughs> it has dirt, right? Um, but if you have healthy soil, you take a good handful of it, you can get um, more living creatures in that handful than there are humans in the entire planet. <laughs> Um, there's a huge living ecosystem. It's um, really tied together. Many of these things we haven't been able to study very well because um, if you pull them out, they don't survive without the other things. Um, so, but people are um, learning about soil just the way we're learning about the microbes in the human body. We're learning about the microbes in the soil and how they can bring health to our plants. The plants have known about these soil organisms for as long as there have been plants. Plants, um, as we know, do photosynthesis. Um, they take carbon dioxide and water, they use the energy from the sunlight, and they make sugar. And they use that sugar to grow, they use that sugar to do all the things. They get their energy, any plant things the plants need to do, they use that sugar. And yet they give away, some people estimate, or more of that to the microbes in the soil. You can bet they don't do that unless they're getting something back. Okay, it's not an accident. And in fact, they get all kinds of things. We'll talk about the different things that they get. Um, they get all kinds of things, many, many nutrients and other kinds of protection um, from the soil microbes. Um, to me, it's pretty amazing. The plant, when it has different needs at different times, can actually make what they call them is exudates. Okay, it takes sugar, they put little proteins on it, and they put that out into the soil. Different exudates are going to attract different microbes. And the microbes can do any number of things. There's different microbes that are good at bringing different nutrients. There's microbes that will help the plant fend off different pests. There are microbes that will actually make plant growth hormone. Um, many microbes build humus, and they can actually reduce climate change. So we'll talk about all of those things. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how the soil microbes are protecting your plant. They actually, um, when people started using fertilizers, there were actually some people um, like uh, Sir Albert Howard, Howard who were kind of looking at what was happening as people were using fertilizers. And they began to notice that as people were using these synthetic fertilizers, the need for pesticides and herbicides started going up. 
they didn't quite understand the reason, and people didn't really care because they were getting good results. Um, but what we know now is that soil microbes um, are going to help that plant in two ways. In one way, you've got soil microbes that have a good association with the plant, and as the um, um, as these you know pests come along, those microbes will actually put things out to kill them. They actually um, have their own antibiotic that they put out into the soil and will kill all other microbes. So that in itself will protect the um, plant. The second thing is is that soil microbes are really good at getting nutrients that the plant wouldn't be able to get otherwise. I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, this is just amazing to me. Um, so we, if we use our synthetic um, fertilizers, we're using NPK, maybe we're using a few other things, we're adding it into the soil. Um, if we eat the food that comes out of that soil, we need 56 different elements. Okay, we're not going to get that from our fertilizer. And if we kill off our soil microbes, they're not going to bring it to the plant. Um, so soil microbes can recover all of these. They can recover them from the sand, silt, clay. Um, they can recover them from organic matter. Um, there are nutrients in your soil that if you go and do your common soil standard te uh, soil test, they're not going to be able to find because it's not going to be able to break down those soil, sand, silt, and clay in the way that the microbes can do. But those microbes can bring back all of those elements and they can bring it to the plant and the plant then makes phytochemicals. And you guys have heard about phytochemicals, sometimes there are, you know, some of them are antioxidants, some of them are other things. And there's been more and more evidence showing that these phytochemicals are um, very good at um, helping the plant to um, take care of itself, to build its own immunity. To build things. Um, there, there's actually been all kinds of research about how plants can even signal other plants and let them know that they need to build something um, to protect themselves when something comes into the area. So these phytochemicals that they're able to make um, are um, um, being used by the plant. The, is there a problem? <laughs> Everything okay? The lights. We were checking the light. Okay. 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 Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, the really cool thing, though, is what we're now finding is that there's a connection between what that plant gets and what we get. And it turns out that those same phytochemicals that the plant uses to fight off diseases, we also will take those plants, make some of our own adjustments in our bodies, and makes us healthy. Okay. And the American Cancer Society and several other organizations are now pushing certain diets that are high in these plant um, um, diets so that people are able to get those phytochemicals to keep a healthy um, body. There are some, there's some really interesting things. People have a BRICS test that they do um, where they can basically crush everything up and look at what is, you know, what is the level of nutrient in the plant um, that we eat, um, but they're improving that and they're going to have specific things that they can look at and hopefully at some point you won't even be able to need to crush it up. You, you know, people have talked about you going to the grocery store and just kind of go ching, 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 and see how much, you know, nutrients things have and at that point I think people would really change what they buy because a carrot is not a carrot, okay? A carrot that is grown in excellent soil is going to have different nutrients. And they're really finding that there are some plants, you've tasted it, you know, when you eat uh, things that have good phytochemicals, it tastes better, it looks better, it's got better color, it's got better smell, okay? And you can tell that. Um, so, um, the, um, Sorry, I got lost at where we're going. Um, so at any rate, um, sorry, I forgot what I wanted to say. Uh, the plants, um, 
are getting those same phytochemicals and we can use those same phytochemicals. Um, um, so I've got, oops. Um, Page. All right, anyhow. Um, soil microbes can actually make plant growth hormone. Um, plant growth hormone is generally made by plants. It controls where and when the plant is going to grow. Um, and these soil microbes can actually make the uh, hormone that makes the plants grow. And it increases the amount of branching in the roots and the amount of root hairs, um, and the amount of overall area that the roots um, have. And the more area that the root has, the more exudates it's putting out, the more nutrients it's able to get in. Okay, really, really important. Soil microbes build humus. Okay, if you're a gardener at all, you know that humus is a good thing. A lot of times people talk about humus as being um, something that is just a byproduct of when you make your uh, compost, it just things just break down into humus. In fact, humus is a more complex thing. It's not a matter of it being broken down to that. The soil microbes are actually taking um, the things that it gets from your organic matter um, and from other places that we'll talk about in a minute, and it makes this very complex structure. And the humus in your soil is going to help with everything because it holds nutrients, it holds water, it buffers for pH, so you don't get too acidic, you don't get too, um, too alkaline. It can chelate toxic substances so that if you're, um, you know, you've got junk in your soil, it can hold on to that so your plant's not getting it. Um, it helps bring warmth to the soil. But the main thing is it's a beautiful, beautiful home for these soil microbes. So you're going to get more microbes, you're going to reproduce, and all of this is going to get um, expanded and um, So I have a little video about um, the formation of humus. Okay? The, um, there's a researcher, Andy Franz Herreras, who's a German researcher, and she did a lot of research on how humus was formed. And basically, she wrote this uh, article, Light the Balls from Stone, that inspired Ennis um, Fritz, um, who's also German. And she made this little video. What she did is she took some sand and some rocks and some minerals, and she put little drops that had the soil microbes on the top. Okay, And then every day, she took pictures. And she watched what happened over, you know, time and time lapse, and that's what, she, what I'm going to show you. Um, so, it, in the first three months, she didn't put anything there. And naturally, algae began to come on top and began to associate with the soil microbes. Um, and then, at four months, she planted plants, which is really the key, and we'll talk about that more. She planted plants, and that increased the amount of humus that was formed. She expected to see over three years the formation of humus. It was only four months after that she put those plants in there that she began to find stable humus. Okay, so this is a quick process. It happens very quickly, um, and it's something that we can really impact.
is those little drops that they placed in there. Basically, it's all sand and salt and that minerals um, with just those little drops on top. And now I'll show you the uh, actual formation. It's amazing how much movement is going on in there. And um, Christine Jones discovered that while we can make humus when we do um, composting, and that organic matter is very important to doing that, if you want long-lasting, the best humus, we'll talk about it later, but um, that's, that forms from association with the plant and the microbes. So one of the key things that we'll talk about is that it's really important to keep plants in your soil. Um, it's actually what she found. It's actually those exudates that the plant is getting the carbon dioxide from the air and it's feeding it down to the soil as sugar. And then that sugar is being changed into humus by those microorganisms. And that is your best humus making process that there is. Okay. So the last thing I'd like to include, even though it's not really a gardening thing, um, is that um, soil has been shown to be able to sequester carbon dioxide. So a lot of people these days are worried about, you know, I shouldn't use so much lights, I shouldn't drive so much, what can I do to try to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide, you know, my carbon footprint. Um, right now we have 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide up into the air. And they have estimated that 360 or lower is safe, so we're already over that number. We're trying to do things, people are doing great things in terms of reducing what we're putting up into the air, but we don't have good solutions for how to pull it back down because already we're too high. Well, nature's been doing it all along, okay? And Dr. Ratan Lal from Ohio State um, has said that a mere 2% increase in carbon content on planted soils could offset all of our greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. So obviously that's a huge amount to do. But um, as Paris talks that they had about climate change, they did have the um, 41000 initiative, if you're interested in reading about it, um, where people are really looking at how can we use soil to bring back some of this carbon dioxide. I think it's one of the most you know positive um, things that people talk about um, climate change. And I also wanted to show you um, the work of Alan Savory. He um, has been working on reducing desertification by improving the soil. I'm just always amazed by this picture because you've got desert on one side and the other side you've got grasslands and that's entirely because of his work improving the soil. Yes. Does he on the other side as well? He's spreading <laughs> many, many places. And that's really his work work right now. So thank you. So how can we increase our soil health? There's several things that we can do. Number one, we all know about this. If you're a gardener, you probably already do um, some composting. If you you know add any kind of compost it's going to build humus. Um, this article just came out, it's very, really cute. Um, what they just found out is that this little arctic fox um, engineers his own land. And the way he does that is he's got this little den underground, 
And then on top, what he does is he adds organic matter. He feeds, he poops, he drops his, uh, you know, whatever's left over that he didn't eat. He feeds all of that on top. And the soil is greatly improved. And you can see from the top view that there's actually, they, they measured three times more biomass growing over where he has left all of this than anywhere else around. Now, the thing that impresses me, though, is not just the improvement in biomass, but there are actually plants that grow on his little mound that cannot grow anywhere else in that ecosystem. That's pretty impressive. I mean, and that's just the soil. Okay. So I want to talk about some of the things that we have done at ACLT. Um, a lot of what we do is um, try to get some of that organic matter into the soil. And one thing that people have been interested in is the Google culture. So this is an ancient method that was used in Europe for a very long time. Basically, they get logs, they'll dig a, a, a hole. Um, you can see we've got a hole up here. Um, then basically what you're going to do is you're going to add logs and then fill in with any kind of other organic matter. It really doesn't matter what that organic matter is. And then you just pile it back over on the top. Oops. Uh, you just pile it back over on top with the with soil. Okay. Um, and we've had some really amazing results from the, the Google Mounds that we've had. Um, let me just talk about some of this is not the right. Uh, I apologize. I yeah. I have the wrong one up. It's a previous. Oh, I was missing slides. Yeah. Um, so the Google Mound is going to um, extend the growing season because it keeps warmer. It's really good at water retention. Um, it builds this beautiful fungal ecosystem because of the, the wood in there. The fungus is really going to be breaking that up, and it's going to be bringing micro, bringing nutrients to your plants. So it's, so it's recycling the nutrients. Um, we. Uh, planted several things, and you can see the big giant uh, uh, sunflower up top. Uh, Ed is the one who built these huge cultures. That's him up top. Um, I had this little extra one of a um, um, sweet potato slip that I needed to put someplace. And I talked to Ed, and he said, "Oh, just put it somewhere in the Google." So I did, and I put it there, and I watered it twice, and then I pretty much forgot about it for the season. And at the end of the season, I went back, and this beast here that I'm holding is one of the sweet potatoes that I made. So we've had like amazing results from these who are called the mounds. Um, they are best for plants that are going to be perennials that are going to, perennials generally are going to prefer a nice fungal um, Soil. So the soils that have lots of wood in them, or um, browns, you know, your your leaves and things like that, are going to make a more fungal soil. And the, your perennial plants are going to like that better. Um, the the things like your annuals and your grasses and things like that are not going to be as happy on a Google mound. Um, my favorite method um, is sheet mulching. A lot of times. I'm trying to start a garden and I don't have enough um, compost already. So um, what I have done is basically done this sheet mulching method. And um, you can see up top, you don't need to do this step, but if you have, I um, see that, that dark, dark barrel up there. I had partially composted food matter. Um, and I just spread that out, and it suggested that that's kind of a good thing to get the worms and things interested, and they'll come up. Um, but you don't need to do that. Um, 
you generally the first step is going to be um, to put down cardboard. The cardboard is going to suppress weeds and whatever else you have growing there. Uh, it will decay and be part of the system, so it's not a problem. And then you're basically just trading off your high nitrogen with your high carbon, your browns and your greens. So examples of browns are going to be leaves, straw, hay, and then you would put a layer of greens, which would be maybe something like manure or grass or food waste, and you just layer it back and forth. Okay, and you want the whole thing to be about eight inches. Um, and then on top, you're going to put a, a layer of soil, a, de a decent layer of soil. So you need to have some compost or some good soil to put on top. Now, many places say that you should wait two or three months before you plant anything. I have not found that to be the case. And people who taught me about it also didn't bother doing that. Um, because again, it's that interaction between the plant and the, the microbes that is going to get your best humus and get everything going so, so well. So I have planted directly into this and had very good results. Um, so some of the benefits that you have, you're suppressing your weed growth, you reduce your labor, you're not, you know, with compost, a lot of times you have to turn things and stuff like that, you don't have to turn anything, all the microbes and the worms are going to go through there, the roots are going to be going through there to help with aeration. Um, and of course it's going to encourage good microbial activity um, and enhance your soil and improve your um, plants. Okay, number two, the second thing that I would suggest is disturb your soil as little as possible. Okay, we have a no-till policy at ACLT. Um, we, we have to put, you know, something out into the soil. We're going to do it with as minimal disturbance as possible. And the reason it is, is that you have these fungal networks. There are um, mycelium that attach, attach to your plant and would extend what it, the roots can do, sometimes for feet, sometimes for yards. I mean, there's some examples that are really, really wide. Um, the brain wrap all these nutrients from all over the place. There's also bacteria that also make these networks. And if every time you go into your soil and you dig it up and you till it, um, you are disturbing that. Now, the reason that people have been telling for all these years is that when you initially do that, you make things available to your plant right away. But you're also allowing those nutrients then to get oxidized and to leave the system. So you really don't want to disturb your soil. Even though you'll get a quick boost out of it, you're breaking down all the guys that live in there. So that's my second recommendation is to disturb the soil as long as possible. This one is the most important. Okay, as I said before, um, Dr. Christine Jones has shown um, that plants in the soil are going to build your most stable humus. Okay, and that humus is going to allow all the microbes to live in there. So a lot of times people get worried about having plants around their plants because they're going to have competition. I put a couple of pictures in here just so you can see what lush, amazing growth that you can have with plants around there. You don't want to have, obviously, plants that are going to come in to keep for sunlight, so that's why we worry about weeds and things like that, but having plants growing around your plants and having them growing perennially all the time is going to be your best benefit for the soil because those plants are there all the time, associating with soil microbes all the time, and building that humus. Okay, and that's what's going to give your soil the stability and the nutrients and, and the, the growth that you want. So here's another picture. I have a question. Yeah. So instead of removing them from the roots, should you just cut them? I do. Whenever I whenever I take out, you know, my uh, tomato plants or something like that, I just cut the top off and leave the roots there so that the, the microbes will just eat it. It'll just decay and just eat it. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of us who are doing vegetables are going to have a problem because the vegetables are not going to be around in the wintertime. So, one option is cover crops. Okay. And we did this in ACLT. Um, 
the nice thing, there's a couple of things about cover crops. You know, they're making sure that there's living things in your soil and you get that that interaction with the microbes going on all winter long. Um, it holds your soil in place, you don't have erosion, but you can also do some nice things in terms of boosting things in your soil that you might be missing. So for example, we grew um, crimson clover and the crimson clover fixes nitrogen, so we added nitrogen to our soil. We also had some tillage radishes. The tillage radishes drill down deep into the soil and that um, makes all of these nice air passages um, and it also helps to bring nutrients up that may be deeper down in the soil, helps build your, your humus deeper down in the soil. Um, the cool thing about tillage radishes is you put them in and then when it gets really cold, it kills them off and then they just decay in the, in the ground and that leaves these nice passageways um, and it needs good food for the, the microbes that are in there. Um, we then break, uh, break these down and, and we're going to break them down more and then like, and afterwards. Um, I just went on a trip to Italy and I was really excited. I got a, um, a tour by a uh, organic grower. He grows uh, wine and um, well, grapes and olives. And we started talking, and he's all excited about soil too, so you know I'm happy, you know. <laughs> and it turns out that conventional growers on the left hand side would till in between because all those weeds would grow up and they would interfere with their, their um, vines and stuff like that. But organic growers now in Italy are leaving all of those weeds there because what they have found is that it's improving their soil, that it's making their plants. Um, more immune to diseases, it's giving them all those benefits that they have. And the second thing that they're doing is they just go with a lawn mower and mow it down just like you would in your lawn, and they leave all that nice organic matter there and that goes back into the soil. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, they, the uh, University of Maryland talks about the advantages of ground covers, and that would be either in, you know, if you are planting say tomatoes and you want to put some things like oregano or something like that underneath or permanently under there they will protect your soil throughout the winter um, um, so these are many of the advantages that university of Maryland talks about having ground covers um, as we talked about improves the soil layer and builds humus fertility and whatnot um, it helps keep the arthritis, so as leaves come and blow in there, and they're going to stay in there. Yeah, Jim? You were talking about the oil, and you have to be careful if you have the right companions. Yes. I'm not sure that everybody can do this. I mean, they can do this. Right, right. So, yeah, you might want to look at what are the good companions that, that work well together. Um, I've had herbs. For my tomatoes, and they, they work pretty well. I didn't have time, and I'm already not a problem. But um, there may be better companion um, things I agree with you. Okay. Um, the fourth thing would be to have a diversity of plants. Okay. Different plants attract different microbes. Um, and so having a variety of plants, when we do these monocultures, we're really asking for trouble because then you basically have one thing growing up above, maybe a few microbes that are, you know, interacting with that down below. But the whole system is much weaker. If you have uh, a diversity both above and below ground, you have much more stability in your entire system. And in particular, we talked a little bit before about having deep-rooted plants um, they're going to increase the soil porosity, allowing water and air and roots to travel up and down through the root system. They're going to build that humus lower levels down. Okay. And then the last thing is try your best <laughs> to reduce or eliminate your herbicides and pesticides and your chemical fertilizers. They will kill your microbes. So while you may benefit um, initially, by putting these things on, you're going to kill off the things that are helping your plants 
fight off the, the, the uh, pests, pests and things like that. And you can see it. I mean, when you look at the amount that people have been using over the last 50 years, it's gone up and up and up because we just need more and more. You know, the, the, the pests are getting better and better, and we're fighting things off worse and worse as our soil um, depletes. And that is pretty much that. I have some resources here, some really excellent books, and some really good websites. Um, and again, my website is up top. If anybody, um, I mean my email, sorry. Um, if anybody wants to email me, I'm happy to send you a copy of the PowerPoint and you can get all of this information now. Any other questions? Yes. I'm trying to picture springtime. So you put the cover crop down. Yes. And then you come around and it's going to be time to plant. Right. So how do you deal with that cover crop? So, uh, people do a variety of things. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Okay, so she said once you have the cover crop, springtime comes around, you want to plant, and you've got that cover crop there, what do you do? Okay. Um, and we have just started with cover crops and come to that same problem, actually. Um, what people generally do, okay, is they, they have these crimpers that knock down and crush up. The cover crop, and then they come in with a machine that kind of drills in their seeds, and they just leave the cover crop right there, and then the plants come up. Now, what we have found, because we don't have all that cool machinery and we're doing everything by hand, is that you do, when you have a cover crop that's tightly built like in there, you do have a lot of root mass down underneath there, and it's hard to get stuff in there. Um, so, you know, you might want to play around with how you do your cover crops. And what you plant in afterwards. I mean, if you're just drilling a seed, it's not so hard. If you have to dig a hole and you've got this root mass in there, so it's all done. Yes. So basically, you're cutting it off, right? And, and planting it in there, right? You just want to leave all that matter right there. But cutting it off so you have something to plant, right? Right. And um, like we have. No, no, no. We have things up, which is like everywhere. Yeah. And that's a, that's a deep root system or something? Well, it goes everywhere. The roots are everywhere. It's everywhere. So would you say to do that as well? Because I'm just concerned about the roots stuffing it, you know, taking it over. And yeah. Dinka is invasive. That's on the, the state invasive list, which is a shame because my mother has it too and I was hoping to use it because it does cover things so beautifully. Um, it is very, very aggressive. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you want is something that's going to stay there year round. You can always rip out your vinca in that spot to plant something. And that plant is definitely going to benefit from having the growth all around it. Okay, so it's not going to like, the vinca is not going to take over the soil of the plant. So. Yeah, I mean, if you have something really aggressive, the main thing that you need to be concerned about is the, the sun. And what people have found is that initially, when you first have a ground cover, um, on a regular year of sun and, and rain and whatnot, um, the ground cover is going to protect your plant and actually give it more moisture because it's shading the soil and not a much, as much evaporation is happening. Um, on a drought year, in the very beginning, it may compete with your plant for the, for the water. But over the years, if you've had it there for several years, your humus is going to hold so much more water that it makes it worthwhile. So you kind of have to get through the you know, drought year as possible. Okay, thank you. Yes. In my garden, I found that um, fighting weeds becomes a problem. So I'm not going to fight you for just using this. But I kind of use it as a cover crop. Is that? An issue? You know what? I there's a lot to be said for weeds. There's a whole bunch of people, and I didn't even get into this, that are researching weeds. There are some weeds, many weeds, that are actually helping your plant. A lot of times the reason that a weed can grow there and other plants can't is because that weed has an ability to fix nitrogen or something so that it can get nitrogen and um, or it can get some other nutrient that other plants can't have. 
and it then brings that nitrogen to your soil. So a lot of times weeds are beneficial to your system. You know, they don't always look beautiful. Um, so, I mean, what I would do is just look and see. Does that seem like it's causing problems to your plants? I mean, most of the reason people don't like weeds is they just don't look nice. It doesn't cause a problem with all our stuff cleaning up as much. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably with something like chickweed, which is not going to be covering a lot of things with the, you know, the keeping sun thing out, is probably very beneficial for you to just leave it there. That's kind of a dangerous thing to say, but <laughs> yes. I've got a good uh, recipe for free chickweed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Did it do I need to remember what that repeat what people are saying? Go ahead and go. Going back to her question about the cover crop, um, I'm very busy. I mean, I, I'm in there growing it all in the entire garden. I'm all the way down in the spring, but we're down there. Right, right. No, I, I agree with you. When, 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 in our experience, when we put in the, the winter wheat, it had a real root mass that was very difficult to go through. Um, I think that you could play around. Like if we had just done the crimson coat clover, it would not have been a problem at all. Because, you know, we would have cut it off and that would have in the end wouldn't have been hard to plant at all. So you kind of have to play around with your own specific needs to what you want to cover with. And if you go to University of Maryland, if you're on the um, extension work, um, Rodales has a really good website about um, these cover crops. You can get different possibilities for what you might want to use for your crop crops. I think, you know, when people do farming, the winter wheat works real well because they've got the machinery and they can just drill in there with the seeds. Um, but that's not necessarily great if you're doing things by hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they're delicious. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Growing in the fall, I mean, in the spring also, I mean, so. Any other questions? Yes. You said uh, avoid pesticides, which I do. Uh, but what do you recommend when using to get rid of uh, things that are in the plants? So there's a couple of things that I do when I'm looking into how how do I deal with you know pests without pesticides. Um, that she mentioned she did a really nice talk earlier in the season about um, companion planting. Um, so the, I have found some success with putting different plants in there to do companion planting. Um, also, I specifically will look at what is that pest and then look up what eats that pest and then what plant can I plant that's going to attract the guy who eats that pest and I've had some success with that. Um, also though, I mean, sometimes Maybe this isn't what everybody wants to do, but sometimes I'll just say, you know what, my soil is not supporting this plant in the way that it needs to be supported to fight off this pest. Maybe it's not worth it to me to plant that particular plant. Now, if you've got something you really want to plant, you're not going to use that method. But there's a lot of things out there to eat, a lot of things out there to grow, and sometimes it's better to just find something that's going to work with your soil as opposed to something that's going to bring in pests that you don't want. I brought in some uh, bought some uh, Brussels sprouts and I put it in my garden and I think that brought some so that plant but I got it some very green bought something. Yeah, those garlic and bugs. I don't know, I can't be yeah. it's, it's starting to eat my beans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, and I had some success also with um, putting geraniums around the rest of this. Forage. 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 Forage.
Yeah. Yeah. Really good. It helps to, to grow the grass in the fall for me. I yes. 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 Yes
particularly those that are advertised to contain microbes and microbes. Yeah, I was wondering if somebody was going to ask me that question. <laughs> so, I have absolutely no basis for this other than within the world, okay? My opinion is, okay, that while um, they probably do benefit to some degree, they come from who knows where. You know, we worry so much now. It's become the big thing to worry about plant invasives. Why are we so comfortable with taking microbes from who knows where in the world and dumping them into our ecosystem? With again, it's the same process that we did. We took all these plants from you know Europe, we brought them here, we thought, oh, these are great plants, we love them in Europe, we're gonna love them here, and now some of them have caused problems. And that's my concern with taking microbes from somewhere else. What I like is to build my microbes up here. And you do that by composting, you do that by you know, growing your plants in your soil all the time. Um, I'm not gonna say not to do it. I definitely don't have any you know, data, and I've never read anything to say that. That's just my opinion, that when you're moving living things around, sometimes you're going to change the balance of things. And we may have invasives that we're inviting in there. Somebody I talked to, and again, I, I didn't read it actually, <laughs> um, said that some of those, those biotones actually come from a uh, desert ecosystem, and what they're finding is that they just don't work here. Not that they cause any trouble, but you know, I don't know. I haven't read that. Yes. So my understanding is very veg is really great and it pairs well with things like corn and stuff like that. Um, but it is very invasive. I mean, if you don't want very veg everywhere, then you might not want to put very veg into your system. It is something you know. What they tell you with the cover crops is to cut them down before they've really done the. They've got their seeds and stuff like that. So if you're good, you might be able to do that with your very veg and prevent it from seeding all over the place. But Yes. Um, one of the things that we, my family and I were, we went to a uh, homestead garden lecture, a uh, homestead garden by Jim Sidney, something like that, and we were talking, we were talking about biotones, this microbial biotones, and that's what we have. But he also said something that I didn't know, is that once you do have it to your soil, you plant it, if you do use it as additive, in a place where it's never received any of those nutrients before. Don't use it again. You only need to put it in one time. And I was under the impression that every time you were planting, you need to put in biotones or whatever, and the microbes. He said one time, you don't need it afterwards. I mean, that would make sense to me because you're actually putting those microbes into the soil, and so long as you're giving it a good situation in the soil that it has organic matter, that it has plants growing in it. Um, it, it should just multiply, you should just continue to have it there. Yeah, so if you do choose to use it, you don't need to buy it. <laughs> yes? All right, how about two bags of it for the paper we had out of ACLT this year? And all I do is do maybe a cup full um, in a 50 foot row just to inoculate the soil, but the soil is dead. Yeah. And I mean, it's I a quick, like easy to way to add those microbes in. Back next year. List all the, all the bacteria and microbes that are in it that, that it has. Uh, you have to be careful. And what I understand that uh, is how the bag is stored, because it may be all dead if somebody left it out in the hot sun in the power for yeah. That would make sense to me if you nailed the problem. You still get uh, your 5% nitrogen and your uh, whatever it is, 3 or 2% potassium and phosphate. So it's regular organic fertilizer. But then, anytime you're adding, um, for just the fertilizer piece of it, anytime you're adding nitrogen or something into the soil, that plant no longer has to pay for nitrogen. It no longer has to put exudates into the ground to get its nitrogen, and it loses its 
association with the, the microbes that are going to bring nitrogen permanently. So that's why I don't ever use a fertilizer. I don't ever put any fertilizers on, um, except I put organic matter in all the time. And if I need more nitrogen, I'll put organic matter that has more nitrogen in it. But, um, but definitely, you know, if you've got really dead soil, you may need to, and that's why I say do your best. But you know, you know um, sometimes you need to start with something. And a lot of and many times people who are in you know in this field are recommending that if you've been putting lots of um, fertilizer in there, you probably need to slowly go down. Otherwise, um, you're going to suddenly you know get a, a crop that doesn't get any nitrogen or whatever that you're trying to get in there because um, those microbes haven't built up since that point that they've been doing. So you know you have to use your judgment. Yes. We have small birds and just really start. And um, so part of it is uh, like four by four that you could have wood around or whatever. Well it's just one of those initial four by four gardens but um, so I've seen and I just want your input on like where you can get a structure that has uh, top, four sides, where it's mesh, where air can get through, but the deers can't, and all these other things, and there's a door. Uh, You're saying for composting? No, I'm saying to get into the garden. Keep the bugs away. To keep the bugs away, to keep the deer away, to keep the rabbits away. Um, so it's sort of like protection in a sense. Yet it can still get the light, still get the water, still get those things. I mean, should we? See, my question is: is if you put something up that keeps bugs away, how is how are your plants going to get pollinated? You know, I mean, you need bugs. You know, you know, <laughs> and generally, if you get a good, if you put a variety of plants, you're going to get a variety of bugs and. Generally, they will keep the populations that you don't want in check. Um, but if you try to keep all bugs out, you're going to have a problem. Oh, not to get that. Good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I've been approached to um, add um, biochar to my garden. Yes. I didn't talk about biochar, yeah. but. To me, it's not cost effective for. A big garden you know, yeah. you know, I know people who have had really great success with it. My reading of what I've read about biochar is that it does similar things as your humus. So if you build really big humus, you probably don't need it. But if you want to boost up your humus effect really quickly, then you can put biochar, and that's what I've read. I, we, we have tried a little bit out at ACLT, and we don't have the really results back to tell us what our opinions are from first-hand knowledge. Um, but, you know, there are people who have swear that they've gotten really, really good results. And from what I can tell just by reading about it, it looks like it does a lot of the things that your humus will do. Holds the, the moisture into the soil, it holds the nutrients in the soil. So, it's just, to me, it's just not cost effective, it's not sustainable. Yeah, if you're trying to put, now, I mean, you're supposed to be able to put biochar in once and it's supposed to last for a really long time because it's humus, you know, good, long lasting humus. But, um, you know, building your humus could be a better method. It's definitely a cheaper method. <laughs> so, yes. What about uh, adding to you? Absolutely, absolutely. If you, I mean, if you grow, yeah, I mean, um, what I would say is that any place you don't have something growing, co cover the ground with leaves or wood chips or any kind of organic matter, it's always good. It's always good. Okay, I'm real confused about that. So, did you put your leaves in first and then grow the cover crop? I would do it the other way around. I would grow whatever you're going to grow. And then if you have any bare ground, still put the leaves in there. What if you learn to put bare ground? Can you just stuff it on top of the cover crop? Yeah, you, probably, you know, so long as you're not covering over the, the leaves and it can grow, it's, it's always good to add organic matter. It's, you know, you're never, you're never going to go wrong by adding organic matter. Is it better to just have a leaf or the cover crop? It's better to have a cover crop. 
it's always better to have something growing in there because that is going to be the path to growing that good permanent humus and that's what's going to improve all of your soil life yes um, if you have a garden right now and you know should you mulch them or is that going to affect the humus within the in, within the garden so again, I would say that every time you add organic matter, you're doing good for your garden. Is it better to have, she would basically ask the same thing, you know, is it better to have plants growing there? Yes. Um, but if you can add in, you know, organic matter and have plants growing there, that's probably ideal. Yeah. So would it be better to put leaves or like wood, wood chips? It, it, to me, the things that I have read, it doesn't make any difference. So as long as you're adding organic matter, it really doesn't matter what, what it is or how you're doing it. Now, I will say that um, Elaine Ingham did some research on different types of plants and what kind of um, mulches to use. And what she found is that when, if you think about succession, and how things go from being grassland to being woods. Um, your perennials that last for a really long time versus your, you know, one that comes up in, in the beginning of succession and it lasts for a year or something like that, your annuals. The perennials prefer things that are going to bring fungus to your system. So those are going to be your browns, your leaves, and your uh, wood chips. If you are growing annuals and you want to put mulch down, you're going to be better putting grass, uh, you know, ground up grass from when you mowed it lawn or something like that, because that's going to give you a better bacterial um, soil, which is what those kinds of plants are going to prefer. Yes? Uh, do, you, do you see these uh, principles also applying to container gardens? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, because it's container gardening, out, you have to keep a lot of soil and so forth, you know, container mix. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of times if you buy some of those mixes, everything's been sterilized, right. and so you then have to, you know, think about how you can add life back into the, to the soil. Um, but I add, you know, dried leaves and stuff like that to mine, and I'll mix it in there and stuff like that when I do container gardens. Uh, first time gardener, so we've got uh, a bunch of peppers and some cantaloupe and all that one, some tomatoes obviously there. Um, what can I put down if the uh, buds that are kind of invasive to the cucumbers and cantaloupe? Is there some sort of ground cover or some sort of. Does, any, does anybody have experience? Would you have a, a suggestion? It's a, he's trying to grow cucumbers and Cantaloupes. Do you have big companions that you could grow with that? You know, the tomatoes, I would grow the carrots with them. No, he said, sorry, cucumbers and cantaloupe. Cantaloupe. Um, concerned about the bugs that get into the cucumbers. Yeah, cucumbers get into the And actually, I think um, lettuce is supposed to be good with um, I don't know if you remember that wrong now. No. I'm just that, that, yeah, that's what you're wrong. See, that's one that you can shape. It's going to get hot. It's going to get cold. Yeah. It's in full sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 Yeah
And what I found is that as you continue to build that garden over the years, your humus is going to get better and you're going to have fewer of those problems. So just keep on building that soil as you go. Um, we had some suggestions also here. A lot of times they suffer from a lot of the fungus like the real deal. So good air circulation is good for the, um, the melon family. But you have to go out there and kind of look under the leaves, wash the eggs, you know, can picking bugs off from the eggs and just keeping an eye out for it. Now, when fungus is a problem, okay, if you have, um, again, you have that competition. So if you have good fungal growth in your soil, a lot of times it will fight the fungus. Um, there's some really interesting things you can look it up with, with compost teas, where you can um, make a compost, and then what you do is you, you make a compost tea, where you can basically take some of that compost and you bowl it for a couple of days. Look it up so they have more detail. Um, you bubble it and you add something in there to feed the compost. Um, usually, it's something like molasses or something. You do it for a couple of days, and then you take that liquid and you can actually spray the leaves, and it will, it will have fungus on it that will fight off of that fungus. So that's something that you might want to look into if you've got fungal problems. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm first time. Gardener and uh, really made some of the gardens for this year. Yeah, wow. I have done. But would you suggest I put uh, ground cover down this winter, or because I do think my soil is building up? Yeah. Uh, because I did put fresh soil and stuff, and I don't think that all done proper nutrients in to get for more time. Would you recommend I put a ground cover or just put a bunch of uh, leaves and kind of just let that sit for this year and then do the ground cover the following? So, you know, ideally you want stuff growing, you want to plant in there at all times. So if you have something that you can plant and works for you during the winter time, that's your ideal solution. But short of that, absolutely cover it with leaves and you would just need to Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people lay down but, yeah, that's what I was saying. Cut this year, and then next the column you do this. That, I think it's sort of another thing to play about. Well, it's a good time to have ground cover around whatever you're growing. Um, and if you do. Uh oh. Yeah. You can put, there's ground covers that you can put, like there's a chamomile that you can put and you can walk on it. Yeah, um, one of the chamomiles, I think it's the Roman chamomile, you can just walk on it. As a matter of fact, it does better if you step on it. Um, so there are ground covers that you can put down and so walk on. What was that? But certain kinds of time also. Yeah. Kind of what time? Yeah. Is that the creeping time? Do you have to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the time that you're going to be careful with the is it the clover, crimson clover? Right. Okay. And then you get your winter wheat. So you have to keep up with the season what cover crop you're going to use. So if you put it in winter wheat, when is that going to be? Fall. Fall. Yeah. Um, yeah. We put it in a little bit late, I think maybe October, probably. Yeah, we put it in November. I think that was a little late. Basically, what you want to do is you want it. To a lot of these cover crops won't look like they're doing much in the winter time, but if you put it in early enough that it's established its roots, stuff is still going on down under the ground, and it may just kind of you know sit there not looking like it's growing much up, up top because it's not, but still a lot is going on underground. Yeah, yeah. 
where you can put it in right after that. Now, if you do your breast, because I mean, I had breast, it was all the way up to December last year, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Some breasts will go to the window. Right, right. It, you know, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter so long as you're growing something that, you know, all the time you're still building that humus and you're still feeding those microbes that are underneath there. Now, you know, brassicas um, are not so great with fungal stuff, so if you're going to grow brassicas, or brassicas it's going to reduce your fungal microbes in the soil, and then you don't want to come in and plant something that's you know, going to need a lot of fungal things, like tomatoes need fungal, so you don't want to follow tomatoes after your brassicas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. I've learned a lot. This has been fun. Thank you. And please do, if you email me, I'm happy to send you all this information. Some of these resources are really great.